uh, visualizing odors with insect brains. Um, so these are two typical ingredients of my uh, talks on insects and uh, matrix algorithms. And normally I would call the talk something like uh, uh, the processing of odor information in the brain of insects. And for this venue here, I thought I call it visualizing odors with insect brains. So we would like to turn an odor, a chemical molecule, into uh, uh, an image. Uh, for starters, we need a certain background on uh, odor perception, and to describe it in one or maybe two words, uh, there's combinatorial coding, which means uh, odors are sensed by odor receptors, but there are almost no single odor receptors, where just one odor binds to the receptor. Uh, so it's a combination of responses in many odor receptors that makes odor identity. Uh, and uh, I give some examples of odor receptors, uh, odor receptor 22A, for example. Uh, and here you see odors, and that's response strength, such as uh, firing rate of the uh, receptor neuron. Uh, and that's a tuning curve. So uh, there's a few odors that are the preferred ligands of that odor receptor and elicit the highest response but it's a distribution and there are many others which also elicit responses. So any given odor uh, has maybe one preferred receptor where it's on the top, and in other receptors it might be here in the middle, in others it might elicit a very tiny response. And it's the overall pattern of responses across all uh, receptors that is characteristic for odor identity. Now, uh, how did that actually uh, work and how do we get access to these uh, odor receptor measurements. Um, now, uh, think of this insect, bee, uh, honeybee, which smells an odor. Uh, then the odor receptors on the antenna start to work, they fire action potentials. Uh, and these action potentials are uh, relayed via the antenna nerve into a structure in the brain called the antenna lobe. And now, <laughs> uh, in this antenna lobe, uh, we got a very compact summary of everything which is on the antenna of all the odor receptors. Uh, so uh, each of these units here, these spherical units called Grimerli, uh integrates uh, the signals from a whole bunch of uh, receptor neurons dispersed all over the antenna. Uh, and the odor uh, response patterns in, in the odor receptors are, are now uh, available in a compact summary in that region in the brain called the antenna lobe, and that's where we can record them. Uh, um, the recording technique is calcium imaging. That's a calcium movie. Uh, so we use calcium-sensitive fluorescent dyes as reporters of brain activity. And uh, that's basically, <laughs> that's basically uh, an, a depiction of the area of that antenna lobe here, and the task is to find where are these units, where there's green, and where there's magenta, and all the others, where are they in the movie? Uh, and once we found them, that's a part of signal processing, once we found them, uh, we can extract the signals. So we can extract uh, the pixel values within uh, this green area and follow them over time, get that green trajectory. Uh, we can extract uh, the pixel values inside the magenta area and get that other trajectory. And these are odor responses of these grammarly. These things have names. It's this conserved structure. We can find it in every, in every, uh, in every insect or it's in every bee uh, and give them, give them uh, unique identifiers. And with the help of these calcium imaging technique, we can record brain activity and activity of these grammarly in response to odors. And these are the features we can extract uh, showing that this uh, is a very high response, this is a little bit of a lower response, and the combined uh, the pattern across all these chromatous responses is what's characteristic for the odor. Um, how do we actually do that? Um, we use matrix factorizations. This is only a, uh, a general framework. Uh, for the details in the algorithms, uh, you can refer to, to the papers, for example, that BioViz that I presented last year. And I'd just like to show you, give you a general overview. Um, we can take the images from a movie and fill them into a matrix. So each row of that matrix with time points and pixels as dimensions, each row is an image from the movie. So we have a movie matrix and uh, we factorize it into a small number, k, 
of time series and k images. And these multiply together again, give a matrix of the same size, uh, but with lower rank, and the rank is k. Uh, that's what's called low rank approximation. Um, what that is basically, uh, the transition from here, from an original image from the movie to that, <laughs> um, the low rank approximation of the movie. Uh, so as you can see, uh, there is something that has been lost. This is only an approximation, but the point is uh, we've discarded mostly noise and this image is much clearer. We can see the glomeruli that respond to the odors uh, and so we can extract the odor response patterns. So that's basically uh, a bit like principal component analysis, PCA, where you can use few factors to account for uh, very much of the variance. This is not exactly like PCA. Uh, we use um, non-negativity and sparsity constraints on the factorization. But the bottom line is uh, we construct a low rank approximation of the movie to get from here to there and to get uh, uh, something which we can use for a visualization. Um, and now finally, um, we can uh, turn to the application, making visualizations of figures for biological papers where we turn odors into pictures. Um, we have one odor, two hexanol, uh, which has been applied at four different concentrations, four, three, two, one, lowest to highest, uh, and that's a time dimension. So here we see consecutive images from such a movie of brain activity, and during the interval marked with a black bar, uh, the odor two hexanol was uh, presented. Uh, and so we see what happens in the brain in response to the odor. Uh, after a few frames, we see a tiny response here. Uh, it lasts for a while. Uh, if we increase the concentration, go one level higher, we see maybe two responses here. And if we increase that further up to, up to the highest concentration, uh, we see a whole orchestra of glomeruli responding and they also stay on for a longer while. And, uh, if you want to know uh, what these units are, uh, you can compare that, register the images to a standard model of the honeybee antelope, lobe where these units have names and are cataloged. Uh, so we can uh, find out which uh, is the identity of the glomeruli that responded. And so we get something, some idea about odor, uh, odor identity. The interesting part in that paper was um, that uh, we compared odor identity and odor concentration. Uh, and as you see, uh, the same odor can look quite uh, different at different concentrations, and that's something which is special uh, in the olfactory system. So it's not like in vision, for example, where we have different receptors uh, for, for intensity and uh, color quality, light intensity, color quality. Here, everything is entangled, one representation, and it is uh, the brain uh, higher processing centers in the brain need to, need to normalize for that. And that's turning an odor into, uh, into pictures. Very short introduction to the topic. And uh, I'd like to uh, acknowledge my co-authors on the paper uh, from BioViz and also uh, the biologists who uh, recorded data uh, and the University of Constance and the Insight Center at the same university for funding. Thank you.